If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 27. Yes, I know I'm supposed to be preaching from the parts that you already read as you're doing read through the Bible. And yes, I got the calendar confused and I picked a proverb that you will read this week. I'm very sorry. It's a short verse. You can handle it. Uh, I, I'm not concerned about that, but I, I did get a little bit off on the calendar when I looked at that because I was not prepared for June the 1st to be Sunday. In fact, I thought it was, you know, I thought June the 1st was sometime next week. Uh, I don't know why I thought that, knowing that I had a uh, conference on May the 30th of Friday in, in Dallas, which is where we were, uh, that would make yesterday the 31st and today the 1st. But, you know, I apparently, you know, calendar was never actually a class. And we made, we talked about this big degree I went and got last week and picked up. And, and yet none of the classes out of, you know, 45 seminary classes, not a one of them was entitled How to Read the Calendar. Uh, so that's something that we missed. I went to school in Alabama back in those days, remember, uh, when I was in elementary school. So, you know, some things can't be told. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1 is the verse that we're going to look at today. It says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. That's a good one to remember. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. Now, if I were to ask most of you, you have plans for tomorrow. You may have good plans, you may have bad plans, but most of you have plans for tomorrow. None of you have reached a point that, for example, you, know, you don't go to the grocery store and only buy one day's worth of groceries at a time. You have plans for tomorrow. You, went, you bought a gallon of milk. You intend that you will finish it. You don't intend to just leave it in there. You have plans for tomorrow. You buy, you know, you, you, your gas tank is full. You don't have just enough to get you through today. You have enough to hopefully get you back to the gas station in the coming days. We have plans about tomorrow. And yet Solomon, when he writes the Proverbs, tells us, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring forth. And we cannot discard this because if you flip on over to James chapter 4, in fact, James, the brother of Jesus, restates this very clearly. He points out that he talks about these businessmen who would talk about that we would today, you know, tomorrow we'll go to thus and such a city and we will make do business. We'll live there for a year. We'll make a big profit. And he says, you all boast about this. And yet all such boasting is evil. However, we need to consider this. What's the difference between boasting about tomorrow and planning for tomorrow? What's the difference between boasting about the day and being prepared for what may come? Because while we may have plans for tomorrow, most of us are well aware of the fact that we don't control it. You may plan tomorrow to get out there and get the rest of your spinach planted or whatever crop you're on this week. Now, I know some of you, some of you still have soybeans to plant. Rice, rice to get watered up, levees to pull, whatever the case may be. You may have a garden to get planted or perhaps replanted. You may have work to get to, all sorts of things to do. You're not boasting. You know that things change. So what do we do with this? Well, first of all, we need to realize that tomorrow should not be the God that we worry about. Many of us allow tomorrow, instead of giving it just this lowercase level letter of a description of a day, that we say tomorrow, well, what's tomorrow? It's the day after today, just as yesterday was the day before today. Instead, we give tomorrow a capital T. And we begin to worship it as if it is a God. We either worship it as if it is the God that we hope for tomorrow will come and it will be a better day. After all, the sun will come out tomorrow. Well, it's already out, okay? But tomorrow will be a better day. Tomorrow I'll be a little bit older, and so therefore I'll finally get this. It's my birthday tomorrow, and I get to celebrate that. Tomorrow maybe my health will improve. Tomorrow maybe he'll finally notice me in the hallways. I know that doesn't apply too much because school's out. But maybe he'll friend me on Facebook and send me messages, and it'll be wonderful. And tomorrow maybe it'll be great. Tomorrow we'll get to do this, and tomorrow this good thing will happen. And tomorrow becomes this God in whom we hope. Maybe tomorrow the government will do something that actually makes sense. It becomes this vain hope. 
Because folks, I've been alive for a while. I was born when there was a president who wasn't even elected to office. And throughout all of those presidents since then, we haven't done any better with elected ones than with the unelected one that I was born under. The government still doesn't make sense very often. Some of y'all are now scratching your heads historically for that. Write that down, look it up when you get home. You figure out which president it was. But I was born during the, the presidency of the only unelected president in the United States of America's history. So y'all can figure that one out later, okay? A little tidbit for you though. But we think about this tomorrow and we put our hopes on it. And sometimes we say, well, it's not tomorrow, it's, it's in a week from now, it's in a month from now, it's when I finally get the job, it's when I finally get this finished, when I finally get the kids in school, when I finally get done with school myself. Folks, you're never done learning, so why worry about being done with school? I mean, yes, you want to get that diploma hanging on the wall, but you always should keep learning. There's always more stuff to know, more things to do. When I finally get done with this, maybe when I finally retire, we put that hope, when I retire, I'll finally get to do this. When we get done with this project at work, I'll finally be able to give time to my family. When we get done with, with this season, maybe when we get done with this particular ball season, when we get past softball, when we get to soccer, it's not as bad. When we get past this, you know, when we get past ballet, the jazz dance, it's not as bad. When we get past this to that, all of these things, and we start pinning our hopes on tomorrow. And that tomorrow becomes our God that we hope for and that we long for. And we pin our hopes not on anything but that eventually the calendar will progress to a point where our life will be better. Others of us have tomorrow as a God, but it's a fearful God. Today's good. But tomorrow could be bad. Today's good, but, but what about tomorrow? Do I have enough? Do I have enough to take care of tomorrow? What happens tomorrow? You know, I have a child. What happens tomorrow if they get sick? I have a spouse. What happens tomorrow if they get mad at me? I have a car. What happens tomorrow if I go out to turn the key and it won't start? Thanks to, to, to generosity and, and travel and such, I have a car that has not been cranked in two weeks. I expect to go out tomorrow and it won't start. I'll have to jump it. It doesn't like to sit around and do nothing for two weeks. Tomorrow, what if this happens? What if that big storm comes in tomorrow? What if tomorrow they look at my, at, at my field and they discover growing right alongside my rice, they find some weird, it, almost extinct animal living in my rice field and I can't ever farm there ever again? What if tomorrow is scary? Tomorrow I have to go to the doctor and they're going to do a scan to look to see what's there. Tomorrow I have to go to have, and, and that's not me, but it might be you. Tomorrow I have to go and have the checkup after my heart surgery. Tomorrow I have a performance review with my boss. This is the time of year back when I worked for UPS that those times actually came. And there was this, there, it, it was this twofold tomorrow problem of tomorrow maybe we'll find out we're actually going to get a raise this year. And also tomorrow maybe we'll find out that I don't have a job next week. Fortunately, fortunately the latter never happened, but honestly the, the former didn't either. We never got a raise, but we also, I also never got fired. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow there's this. And we let tomorrow become a fearful God that we worry about. What if this happens tomorrow? And yet, Jesus tells us, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We boast, though, in our tomorrows. We either boast and exalt them to the point that they rob our today of its joy because we fear tomorrow, or they rob today of its joy because we, we don't take the joy in what God brings us today, and we're too busy waiting for tomorrow. There's a difference between pinning all of our hope on tomorrow and having the joyful hope that we have. I have a joyful hope that there is a better day coming. Stan May, who was our pastor years ago in, in the Memphis area, when we lived in Olive Branch, always talked about, he said, for example, the Apostle Paul had two days on his calendar, today and that day when he stood before the Lord Jesus. And his focus in life was that he was going to do today whatever was necessary, that on that day, 
he would be acceptable and present his life as an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I like the fact he always, he always said Paul didn't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow didn't matter. That day did. Our hope is not in tomorrow. Our hope is in that day. Whether it's that day when you lay your head down and close your eyes for the last time on, in, in this existence and you open your eyes and you're in eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe it's that day when you're walking through the field and you look around and you hear music and you see something amazing like you've never imagined. And it is that the Lord has returned. And it's one thing to hope in that and to have peace in that. It's another thing to have our pen on all of our hopes on, well, tomorrow maybe it'll be better. Maybe just a little bit instead of putting our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where the difference comes. Do not boast about tomorrow. Don't give it more than it's due. Tomorrow's just another set of 24 hours. Most likely it'll come in while you're sleeping. It'll go out while you're sleeping. Unless you're a strange kind of night owl, in which case it'll come in while you're awake. It'll go out while you're awake. But you'll still sleep away part of it. You may spend it on the road. You may spend it at home. You may spend tomorrow at work. You may spend it watching television. You may eat. You may not. Depends on what your preferences are. When tomorrow comes to its close, you may say, well, it was a good day. You may say it was a bad day. But you're as assured tomorrow that there'll be a day after that as you are today. There may be one, there may not be one. That falls into the power of God and not into your ability to worry it or hope it into existence. Folks, you can't worry another day onto your life and you can't hope another day onto your life. Neither one extends anything. So what do we do if we're not going to worry about tomorrow? What are we going to do if we're not going to boast about tomorrow? What do we do to put tomorrow back down with a lowercase t and have it just another day on the calendar? First of all, we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself told this story about a rich man who had a great harvest. He had a great day. It was a beautiful day. Because his workers went out and they brought in this magnificent harvest. And throughout it all, his combine didn't break down. Nobody blew an ACL or an Achilles tendon. Nobody threw out their... That, that was his combine. <laughs> you guys worry about belts and gears and pulleys and all that kind of thing. He has to worry about workers. Whether or not they pull a muscle, break a, break a side, rip out a sack as they're carrying stuff in. He didn't have any donkeys break down on him. No wagon problems. No trouble with his grain parts. He has this magnificent harvest. And as it all starts to come in, he says, oh my, I don't have enough storage for this. What shall I do? He says, I know what I'll do. I'll get some grain bins built. I'll build bigger barns and store more of it and keep it all for me. And then I won't have anything to worry about in the world. That night it's told to him, you fool. Today, your soul will be accounted for you, will be demanded of you. You'll have to give an accounting for your life. And we can take the wrong lesson from that story and say, oh, all you guys that have grain bins are sinners. Now, don't take that lesson, all of you that I look at here and I know you've got grain bins. We could take from that, like, from that the wrong lesson and say, if you've ever been a grain bin salesman, that you were really a sinner. But we know that that's not the case either. What we should take from that is this. It's appropriate to plan and consider. But it's not appropriate to hoard and put our trust in the wealth that we can get our hands on. This is the mistake of that man. He boasted about tomorrow. He looked at his bin. He looked at his grain bins. And yes, your Bible says silos in Luke. All right? In Luke chapter 12. Uh, yeah, Luke chapter 12, it says silos. But just read that as grain bins. Because a silo has a different purpose. A silo stores silos, which melt, but breaks down and you use it as camel feed. That's not what it was. He was storing grain. It's a grain bin. Thousands of Greek academics apparently have never you know, talked to farmers to know exactly what piece of equipment, piece of, uh, of construction we're talking about. 
It's not a sin to have a grain bin. It's not a sin to have a savings account. Those of you that have them. It's not a sin to have a bit of a plan for the future. It is a sin to look at it and say, I don't need God anymore because I've got this. It's a sin to look out and look at your workers who have just hauled in all of this. And, you know, I told you you didn't have a combine, you had workers. It's a sin to look at your workers and say, y'all go on away, I'm going to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And not share it with you. Not provide what you need. In fact, James addresses that and talks about the, the wages that we have paid, that we fail to pay. The workers in our fields cry out to God against us. We have to be careful with that. But it's a sin to say, I've got it taken care of. My tomorrow is secure. I don't need God. And that's what this man has done. You look at your tomorrow and you say, I'll, it'll be all right. I don't need to lean on God for tomorrow. I've got a good job. I've got good health. I've got health insurance. I've got, I've got everything I need. My house is paid for. My car is paid for. Everything's fine. Maybe later I'll worry about needing God. I don't need God right now. I, after all, I'm young. That applies to some of you. I feel like it applies to me like it used to. I used to think more, more like this, that I've got a whole lot more life left. And I do. I'm about middle-aged. Some of you think you've got 50, 60 years. You boast about that tomorrow. I don't need to worry about God now. I'll deal with Him later. But what you don't know is whether or not later will ever come, and that even if it does, if you'll even think about it. Because you'll put your trust in barns and for every day that you're able to build a bigger barn, every day that you're able to build a bigger green bin, every day that you're able to put it off and boast about the next day, even more you'll start to crowd out thoughts about what really matters in this world. What really matters in this world is that you weren't made for this world in the first place. You were made for a world that was perfect and redeemed by the power of God. And that's what God has created us for. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. We weren't made to live in a world with cancer, but we live in one. We weren't made to live in a world with disease, death, pollution. We were made for a world that's watered beautifully by four rivers all the way around each side. That's the world that humanity is created for. But there's only one way through that, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection, that glorious moment that you get when you get to the back of the book. And I know we're reading through the Bible in order, and you won't get to Revelation until December. But let me give you a sneak peek. In that day, it's all made new. And the earth that we dwell on, and the heaven that we live in, and the new Jerusalem that we get to gather in is better. Because what's supposed to be alive stays alive. And what's supposed to be dead, death, hell, Satan, are bound and cast into the lake of fire. But if we continue to boast about tomorrow and never think about that day, then one day that's going to catch up to us. And we will miss it. Because we will have rejected trusting in the one who can get us there. So the first thing we do is we put our trust in God. It was made it possible for us to get through tomorrow. The next is this. Consider your life. My fellow believers in Christ, consider your life. Have you built a life that insulates you from needing God? Let me ask, let me put it to you this way. If God didn't provide for you tomorrow, except for air and sunlight, how long could you live without seeing the hand of God at work in your life? For some of us, we've built a life that is so insulated from the power of God that we actually wouldn't notice. This was the tragedy of Samson's life when Delilah whispers in his ear that third time, Wake up! The Philistines are upon you. Samson was so used to doing things that he didn't even realize the Spirit of God had departed from him. What about your life? What about your relationships? What about the things that you do? What do you do? What are you involved in in your life that only works at God's end? Some of us, we know that's the truth in our, in our families. 
The only way that my family has the patience to not make me sleep in the street is because the power of God gives them dependent on God for. What are the things that we do as a church that we are not, that we are dependent on God for? We can plan and committee everything half to death. And sometimes the bane of, of a well-organized church is this. We don't need the Holy Spirit because we have a committee. And that's something we need to be careful of and be cautious of. Our prayer needs to be the most important thing. We have business meeting this week. Something we do every month. And we can sit there and we'll look at the finances and we'll look at the old business and we'll look at the new business and we'll look at the numbers and we'll look at the this and look at the that. And it's important to be good stewards. But if everything we do is based on, well, on paper I can make it work, Folks, we're leaving no room. We're taking no action. It requires us to be desperate that God would work among us. Many of us look at people that we don't bother trying one more time to share the love of Jesus with because, well, we've tried. And they say, you know, after you try three or four times, you might as well give up. But you're right. After you try three or four times to share, to share the gospel with somebody, please, you give up. And the next time, Share the gospel with them and be desperate that God does it. Because you've done it. It's time for you to let it go. And be the voice of God instead. And be someone who's used by God instead. It's one of the reasons that we've talked about it. And several of us have, you know, we kind of came to this conclusion as a church that we wanted to be more evident that we were crying out to God in prayer on a regular basis. And we added that to our worship service. Because today we want to ask God for his daily bread. And we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Because we don't know what a day will bring forth. What are we doing that will utterly fail if we don't see the power of God released? I'm going to challenge you to think about that in your life. What ways are you reaching? What ways are you trying to grow? What things are you striving to accomplish? How are we as a church living dependent on that? Because instead, we may slip back in boasting about tomorrow and say, well, we've made sure we've got a good plan that everything will be here tomorrow. But we don't need to be here tomorrow if the power of God is not evident. That's what we need to be desperate on and focused on. Do not boast about tomorrow if you do not know what a day may bring forth. So what about you? What's your hope in for tomorrow? Is your hope that tomorrow that the diesel mechanic will show up early and get the tractor running so that you can get work done? Is your hope for tomorrow that maybe tomorrow the allergy medicine will kick in, you'll actually be able to breathe for the first time? Is your hope for tomorrow that hopefully the Social Security check actually showed up and deposited in the bank like it was supposed to? Is your hope for tomorrow that maybe you know, this will happen, that you'll have a good day at work instead of a bad day at work? Maybe your hopes that the boss won't show up so that you have a positive day? Folks, I used to work for a boss too. I know you have days like that. Who? the boss will stay home tomorrow. We'll have a good day. We'll actually get work done. Is your hope for tomorrow that maybe this time the baby won't cry quite as much? Is your hope for tomorrow that maybe the, the, the arthritis won't hurt quite so bad or that the, this ailment won't bother you quite as much? Or is your hope for tomorrow that tomorrow you'll walk with Jesus in such a way that when you get to the end of the day, it'll be today I walk with Christ? Maybe I had problems, but I noticed more than that that I was in the presence of the one who I want to be with for all eternity. That's a choice that you make for your day. I know what I want my choice to be. And I want to encourage you to make the same one that tomorrow, the rest of today, and every tomorrow after that, instead of worrying about the day, we stand up and say, Lord, here am I. If you don't bring me through it, I don't even want to bother. Let's pray.
pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you that you brought all of our tomorrows together to be here. We pray that you will help us to walk well with you in the week to come. It will help us to honor you in what we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come to the time of our service.